just uh, talking about 50 years from the from the walk off. You know, it's a it's a very it's a very significant moment, I think, for the for the Aboriginal movement. And it's been wonderful to be able to spend some time just before this talk with with you know some of Jason's elders talking about that time period. I also got to um, spend a bit of time the other night talking with some of the Gurindji who actually went through this strike about the time period and just really trying to connect in again to, to that moment and to the feeling at the time. It's also very significant for us as the left and as revolutionary socialists because, you know, as much as a lot of the mainstream media is about Whitlam putting sand into people's hands and that sort of thing, the truth is, you know, in terms of from the non-Indigenous side of things, the people that were at the middle of building that strike were revolutionary socialists. They were people who wanted to see the end of capitalism. It was people in the, in the Communist Party who were actually there, you know, and I go on to talk about, you know, helping to organise some of that early meetings, helping to organise the struggle. So this is our legacy, you know, in terms of as a socialist organisation here that we need to, I think, <laughs> stand up and defend from the likes of Malcolm Turnbull, Pippi Eek and Breeze into Wave Hill 50 years on and get a few photo opportunities as he's going to try and do next week. Um, so, you know, it is, a, I think it's, a, it's an important time, it's an important time uh, to, re to, reflect, to reflect on. Uh, because it was really, um, I think, that strike, you saw and you look at the strike, you can pull out, you can really learn from some of the best, you know, moment in terms of a fusion of, on the one hand, uh, militant and uncompromising black politics, uh, a refusal to accept the regime of control, the colonial regime that people were living under, a regime of slavery you know, that existed at the time, as Jason has described, a regime of brutalisation, murder, child removal. It was a refusal to accept that. And it was, a, you know, and it was a, 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 an act of profound resistance against that. And it was also actually a refusal to accept dispossession and the imposition of colonial law. And it was done by people who stood up and said that they had a law, that they had a way of seeing the world, and that they actually stood in that, in resistance to what was being imposed on them. That th that, that was their land, no matter what had said, no matter how many generations had passed, no matter who had the guns, that that was their land and they weren't willing to let go of that vision. So you saw a fusion between that and militant working class politics, revolutionary socialist politics, you know, and, and you know, and it was, and, and I think trying to trying to look at and pull pull out of that, I think there's always there's very you know profound lessons uh, that we need to that we need to learn going forward. Um, j just talking about the, the ways that the two things fed into each other, because at the one, at, on the one hand, the strike would not have been possible without the level of working class militancy in Australia and globally being on the rise. You know, it, it was because unions could actually offer a level of support, because people could actually see struggles taking place, that they felt the confidence to go on strike themselves. And just to give you one little example of that, one of our comrades, Tanya McConville, actually spent time in the Gurindji strike camp in the 1970s. And she says when she first heard about the strike, she was in London, and she was uh, pulling beers uh, in London for people who worked actually in a Vestie's Meatworks um, in London. Right, who, who, who'd come in and they'd seen Frank Hardy's film, The Unlucky Australians, they were all talking about it. And Vesties, the people that they were fighting against on Wave Hill Station that they walked up against, was a global empire. I mean, they had, you know, cattle stations across South America, across Australia. I mean, Wave Hill itself was the size of Belgium. But they also had meat works, they had, you know, these butcher shops all over the world. And those, those workers, Took, took in London, in the Vestis Meatworks, took a one-day strike, took a collection in solidarity with the Gurindji and actually sent the, you know, sort of sent the money back. So that way that capitalism actually organically pulls together oppressed people, you know, in a system of exploitation and they can recognise that they have a common enemy, you know, because Vestis is the one that's exploiting them and stopping them from having the money they need to feed their kids, working late nights or whatever. They could see that these people on the other side of the world you know, were, were hitting besties, they said, we're behind, these, we're behind these strikers. You know, so on the one hand, it was that global sort of um, upsurge of union militancy in the period that, you know, that this, that this strike, you know, took place in. But on the other hand, you know, the, the, the militancy and the perspective of the black militants, you know, at the time, profoundly influenced the development of the new left in Australia profoundly influenced the way that the, that, the, that the unionists and the others that were actually leading the struggles actually came to see the system they were fighting against, came to understand its brutality, came to understand its genocidal foundations, you know, came to understand that, you know, that, 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 that you know, while they're fighting, you know, against the war in Vietnam or they're fighting about South African apartheid, actually there's apartheid here and that's the nature of the ruling class in Australia and if we're going to deal with them and we're going to fight them, 
We have to be able to understand, you know, you know where, where their power comes from in the settler colonial context, you know, and how and, and, and the brutality that's that, that's needed to maintain it. So it was also, you know, you know that, that they fed each other, you know, in terms of developing, you know, in terms of developing, um, you know, that, that perspective of of the of, of, of the system that we live under. You know, and, and this was, I think, you know, you really saw a breakthrough in that second, you know, so, sort of part of, the, part of the story that I described that comes after a very long history, actually, if you want to look at it, of the way that the black movement and the working class movement, the union movement in this country have been, you know, fused together, you know, you know the whole way along. So, you know, um, everyone in this room would know Jenny Munro, you know, a strong, you know, a strong Aboriginal leader here in Sydney. I've had a good conversation with her brother, uh, Les. You know, who was insisting to me um, when we were at a protest camp one night that actually the shearers strike in the 1890s and the participation of black shearers in the shearers strike that was, you know, all up and down the east coast in the 1890s was, was he said, that profoundly shaped the political consciousness of those black shearers who were involved in that at the time. It gave them some idea, a bit of a taste of the possibilities of mass action gave them a bit of an understanding of some of the divisions that existed actually within this society that they just saw as white society oppressing them. They could see the class structure, you know, that actually emerged there. That was foundational, he said, for, you know, that experience of that strike was foundational for, you know, for the activism that was to come. You know, all through the 1920s, the 1930s, you know, you, you had, you know, a, a situation where the strike tactic was used by Aboriginal militants who had been out, you know, in the workforce and when the depression came, were forced back into reserves, were forced back into missions, were forced back to live under these sort of degrading conditions and went on strike, actually on reserves across uh, New South Wales through the, through the 1930s against the dictatorial controls they were under, the, you know, terrible pay, you know, or whatever. They used that, they used that strike tactic. The 1946 Pilbara, you know, walk off, um, you know, that came after the, that came after the Second World War again. You know, um, you know, uh, something that was that was led, you know, by by people that organised on the basis of traditional authority. I mean, they had big tribal meetings over many years, actually, to actually plan this strike, and chose the first of May, uh, the D Global Day of Workers' Action, as the day when they would walk off the walk off the sheep stations and the cattle stations, and you know, and mount a and mount a strike about the way that they were treating them. Again, communists, you know, were, were in there, you know, um, you know, sort of helping to contribute to the, to the development um, of that perspective. Then all the way through the 1940s and 50s, in the 1950s in, in Darwin you have uh, people in Bagot Compound, workers around Darwin, Aboriginal workers on strike, marching in the streets. You know, the North Australian Workers' Union sort of at that time started seriously taking up, you know, the issues of Aboriginal rights, uh, you know, sort of in that context. And all of that was the sort of the basis for what, what ended up happening with the, you know, what ended up happening with the, with the Wayfield Walcott. Because as you know, more black workers actually started to join the unions, and as the unions started to see that there was a struggle coming, you know, from those workers, particularly as I mentioned, the North Australian Workers Union, you start, you, you had, you had unions, unions in Australia, really providing some of the bedrock for the, for you know, for CATSI, uh, Federal Council for Aboriginal and Islander Advancement, you know, who, whose program was around equal rights and equal pay. You know, so through the 50s, through the 60s, you know, worked with the unions to actually start putting in, they lodged a case, you know, in the early 1960s, helped to lodge a case with the North Australian Workers Union actually calling for equal pay uh, within, the, within, the Australian, within the Australian mainstream Australian arbitration system. And reading back again the accounts of the actual strike, you can really see so much of what happened with the Gringy walk-off is basically, you, on one way you can see it, is this is a rank-and-file revolt against the conservat the conservat conservatising approach or conservative approach of the union officials trying to negotiate equal pay. Right? So they're saying there's this, there's this case in the arbitration court, that's the answer. You know, and these you know, black workers are getting more and more, they're seeing some of the struggles around, they're getting more and more frustrated about what they can actually do. We're waiting for this court, what's this court, when's it going to deliver its result or whatever. And in 1965 the arbitration court actually rules that equal pay will be granted. Um, on, on cattle stations, you know, in the, in the Northern Territory. But it won't come until December 1968, right? So we'll grant equal pay, but it's not until December 1968 that we'll actually see it happen. The North Australian Workers' Union is under an enormous pressure from the, from the you know, the, the black workers in the pastoral industry at that time who say, we don't accept that, we want equal pay now. And they can't hold it back. There's a, they've employed an Aboriginal um, uh, organiser called Dexter Daniels, 
Um, his brother had actually gone on the invitation of the Kenyan, um, uh, new Kenyan Prime Minister from the Kenyan independence movement actually to go and visit a country where black people were now in power. You know, people's consciousness and people's feelings were, were rising. They said, we're not accepting this. We're going to wait until 1968. I can't hold it back any longer. And, you know, and Tanya has also described to me some of the discussions she's had with people that they were meetings of black workers happening around the race, race meetings. I uh, was one of, the, one of the only times that black workers from all the different stations were able to get together was at race meetings. Since 1962, they've been meeting and saying, we need to take action, we need to do something, we need to have a revolt. It happens. First of May 1966, Newcastle Waters Station um, on Woodborough Country, they walk off. They have a strike. Small, small contained strike on one place. And the North Australian Workers' Union says, we'll back you. We'll put an appeal to the Southern Unions to actually fund uh, the strike, you know, as it's going, but no more. We'll have this little strike on Newcastle Waters and we'll start a new process of negotiation with the Australian Council of Trade Unions and with the employers. We'll have meetings in Sydney and we'll see what we can do about getting you a little bit more pay while we're waiting for, while we're waiting for 1968 for no, but no more. And that's where the communists came into it. Because, you know, Frank Hardy goes up to Darwin, you know, he's trying to get away from stress in Sydney, he says, so he goes to the Northern Territory so he can do his writing. I sort of, you know, look at how he feels. We'll go to Darwin and retreat into his writing from the stressful politics of Sydney. But he can't help himself. He gets to Darwin. He's talking to Dexter Daniels, who's saying, Frank, what do I do? People out there on all these stations, they want to walk off, they want to walk off now. And Paddy Carroll, the Labor Party official of the North Australian Workers' Union, he won't let me do it. What do I do? So for us, this is a classic situation. How do you get around the reformism of the trade union bureaucracy? How do you actually organise? Frank says, right, okay, well, what we're going to do, well, how about we, we call meetings, we'll call it reinvigorated, it already existed, we'll reinvigorate the Northern Territory Council of, of, of Aboriginal Rights, we'll call meetings, and then that body will be able to support the strikers, and we might call the union's bluff and force them into, into, actually, supporting the, into actually supporting the strike. So they have a meeting of 200 uh, Aboriginal people at Rapid Creek, to found the, the, the Northern Territory Council for Aboriginal Rights. They say, we will support strikes. If people want to have strikes, we will support them. Dexter Daniels says, I'm going to go down. I know he, he met Vincent Lingari in the hospital and he heard about Wayfield was ready to move. I'm going to go down to Wayfield and I'm going to pull them out. Paddy Carroll says, look, I'll support you going down, but you're just to report back on their, their, their feeling. You're not to pull out anyone else on, out on strike. And Frank Hardy says to him, but if they go on strike next to you, you can't stop them, right? You know, so so you, you can see here, this is what this is, this is a rank and file revolt against the this is a rank and file revolt against the conservative of the union bureaucracy. They do walk off, you know, on Wave Hill. This does push the this does push the issue, and they do force the union's hand, and Paddy Carroll actually comes out and says the North Australian Workers Union will back the strike. And then the, you know the, 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 the network of militants around the Communist Party and others swings into action. Frank goes back to Sydney, they start organising speaking tours, you know, people come down and speak all around. And I just want to make a point about why it is so important that we actually build revolutionary organisation. You know, if they were not able to offer a network of militants across unionised sites all up and down the East Coast, there would have been nowhere for these people to go to actually build their support. But because those, that network existed, so just because you're not doing Aboriginal rights work, if you're building your union, if you're building a revolutionary organisation, you're building up the capacity and the strength to actually support those struggles when they can and they do break out and they will break out. So just, just, just did want to make that point because those networks were absolutely crucial and absolutely important. You know, so right up and down the East Coast, people travelled. They spoke to 60 meetings in a couple of weeks or something I read. They collected thousands of, 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 of pounds to actually support the, you know, to actually support the, the, the strikers and, and, and be able to keep it going, and they, and, they, and they pushed the thing along. And then the offers started. So the offers of, of, of they actually, Vesties offered to increase the pay of the Gurindji strikers by 125%. That was the offer. You know, if you come back, if you, if you come back to work. They were worried about what it would do, breaking out of the containment and actually spreading. You know, but it was at that moment, it's very interesting when you read the book. It was at that moment, it's at that moment when they make that offer and the Gurindji actually say no, that Frank Hardy starts to come to a realisation that there is something else going on here. These people are not just talking about getting paid equal wages. He's been talking about everything in terms of civil rights, equal rights, wages, conditions or whatever. But all the way along there's been this talk about, you know Frank, this is actually our country. You know Frank, we actually have our own law. You know we're actually really senior people in our law. Besties just aren't listening to that. They're not respecting our authority. 
it, the pennies sort of start to drop and they actually come out with it and they say, what we want is we want our land back. What the, what's actually driving our struggle here is we want to establish, re-establish our authority and we want to re-establish our connection. And the piece of land that they select, where they're actually going to set up a camp and refuse to leave to actually occupy and demand their land back, Dagaragu, had incredible significance for the Gurindji. The actual area where it is is very rich, you know, in terms of the dreaming stories. There's a number of sacred sites that are there. It was rich in terms of their resistance history, not just some, you know, ossified history, a history of living resistance, you know, sort of that's come, you know, sort of from their perspective. There were bones of the Aboriginal people that have been killed in massacres, held in caves. They were actually inside the lease area that they put out that they wanted to, that they, that they actually, that they actually wanted to, um, that they wanted to, to claim back. And the, I mean, the other important thing to understand in that context is that the meetings of Aboriginal people that have been happening in Darwin were also not just discussing wages. The, um, speaking with Donna, Donna Jackson, who's a Larrakia uh, woman, when I was up in Darwin, she said that the story from her elders in Larrakia country is that through the, through the mid-1960s, the Larrakia actually held Aboriginal meetings and Aboriginal ceremonies where they invited people in from a number of different tribes and they said, we need to use our land here in Darwin, Larrakia land, as an organising point to fight to get our land back right across the Northern Territory. That, that actual offer had been made to people. Use this as a base. Here is where you can organise. Here is where you can struggle. And the networks and the people that were doing that, she said, were people that had spoken with the meat workers in the Vesties Meat Works. Had been involved with the with the Rights Council and with the Union Council, and had known that there was a system that that needed to be fought. And there are other people that wanted to fight the system, but they were bringing their own unique perspective. Their own unique, um, you know, sort of their own unique sort of demands, sort of through that, um, through that, through that process. So I'll, I'll just read a couple of little quotes from the book because I thought I thought they were quite interesting in terms of in terms of what because you know I think as socialists we have an understanding right around the world that colonised people because as a reaction to the racism, the suffering and everything that's come, people will demand self-determination. They will demand the right to be able to separate off and free themselves from the oppressive you know, colonial power and so they can have their own, you know, what they feel is their own power and their own process of development. But I think there's some particularities with the Aboriginal situation in Australia that actually come from the experience of Aboriginal people in Australia that are quite particular um, and, and, that, and, that, and that bring a particular edge to some of the discussion that happens around self-determination. The first of those, I think, is that the society that existed here before colonisation was a classless society. So, so people have got an understanding that there is another way of doing business where there actually aren't any bosses where we actually all had an equality. And that language of, you know, we, you know, we looked after each other, we had, a, you know, we had something, that, that's infused through all of this. You know, you're treating each other terribly, exploiting each other. You know, we want a return, you know, to, the, to, to an egalitarian sort of, sort of way of life. I mean, I've got some quotes from different struggles, but I don't think we've got time. We can sort of, we can sort of just make the, make the point. And the other thing is that, that there's this profound counter-hegemonic um, quality to it where you say... Yeah, sure, you have got your state and your law, but there is actually an alternative system of authority that's here, that's based in our own, in our own sort of society. And that came through very, very strongly in the, very, very strongly in the, in the way he strike. So, you know, Vincent's interviewing Frank Hardy's book, you know, he'll say, um, I'm Vincent Lingiari from Wave Hill, that's my proper Aboriginal name. Tom Fisher and the Vesti mob call me Tommy Vincent, but my people are Gurindji. This is my country. We live here a long time before the coup about the white people. I have Ganabiba ceremony. Ganabiba is the mother of all the Gringy people and the corroboree dancers tell the story of a man and his son spewed up by the rainbow snake in Wadi Creek in the dream time. I'm a Kratajeri man of the Gringy people, but the best in what they don't understand about that. You know, the Tom Fisher, he says, we wave for Aboriginal native people being called Gurindji. We've been here a long time before them, best in what. They put up building, they think they own this country, but this is our country. All of this is Gurindji country. And even Dexter Daniels, who was working for the union, you know, he put forward, you know, that, that you know, he wanted to organise along his, you know, uh, uh, along what he considered to be Aboriginal lines. So the totem of the Roper River tribe, which he went from, it went all the way from Alice Springs to Arnhem Land that connects us all. My people can unite someday. And I was thinking maybe we can unite in our own way. You know, so wanted to draw on that interconnectedness, you know, that actually is built into their, you know, in, into the way, you know, people understood clans related to each other. He wanted to, you know, build that into a struggle, you know, that can actually, that can actually uh, take on the system. He says, we'll work with the white Europeans, we'll work with the Labour Party, we'll work with the Christians, we'll work with the communists. 
but we'll keep our own Aboriginal law uh, to guide us. Okay. And, and Frank, is, he's, he, Frank Hardy's writing, he's talking about these same things. Like, each day I went to the riverbed and I talked to the Aborigines, you know, the leaders. They appeared to combine these functions of tribal elders, you know, and combine, you know, their ideas of tribal authority, you know, in with, um, in with the politics around the strike and their role as strike leaders. I was confronting a very new dimension in human life, you know, and I think that that... The left in Australia, in terms of trying to understand and trying to relate to that, it is about you know, trying to confront and, and understand what was here on this continent previously and how can some of the vision that's asserted by Aboriginal people through struggle actually inform all our own, all our own struggles about a transformation of the system that we find ourselves in. And I did make the point about the Larrakia because the, 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 they've been very, very good, I think, in terms of a response to the walk-off and a response to the land rights struggle in trying to segregate this idea that those ideas of traditional ownership or authority or whatever, that's just people that are in the bush areas. You know, it's not people that have been, been urbanised or whatever. And the NT Land Rights Act actually very, very explicitly says no claims over Darwin. No claims over Alice Springs. And they did that very explicitly because they said we do not want to give any hope to any of the people on the southeast coast who've got their own claims over land and stuff like that living on the fringes of towns, that they might be included somehow in this, you know, sort of in this, in this new land rights movement to cut those things out. So it's not a profound question about how does the property system in Australia work? You know, how can we deal with the fact that, you know, and, and, and respect the fact that there's people all over this country that have got a, a desire to have a say over what they consider to be their land. We're going to cut it up and segregate it and it's only the tribal people or the people that have maintained or whatever. That's the only little, little sort of area in which you'll be dealt with. Very, very effective wedge and to, to, to depoliticise and de-radicalise some of the implications that actually come out of the demands, the demands um, that, are, that, are, that are there, that are there um, sort of in the struggle. I think Jason was sort of talking about, I think some of these ideas I personally think are very, very important in terms of struggles that exist around land use and around environmental justice. You know, you've got a lot of Aboriginal people that are out there fighting against destruction of their land, you know, by, by trying to say there is an alternative view that is about actually respecting that land, its history and its, and its, and its particular characteristics and its particular importance, which we've developed over many, many years in song, in story, you know, sort of, or, or whatever it is. I think it's quite a, you know, quite a, quite a powerful sort of way of sort of trying to look at the world and understand how we might move away from our system, which looks at land and sees money, which looks at land and sees commodities to be traded. You know, or whatever. So I think some some of the struggles that are happening now, you know, around those questions of climate change, uh, land justice, etc. You know, they 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 can, I think, be, play a very important role in in a movement about transforming. You know, how our destructive system actually actually has to relate to the environment. But it, it very very much be, needs to be fused with. I think that you know that other aspect that really came through the struggles of the 1960s and the 1970s are of a refusal to accept being treated in this way and actually organising to assert that being treated in this way is now no longer going to be possible. They couldn't get away with paying people in rations anymore when people said we will go on strike if you continue to pay us in rations. They couldn't get away with taking children away in the manner they did when people organised at the community level, built the alliances with the unions, built some institutional power and said, we are going to say no more and we are going to say you need to actually fund and listen to and respect you know, Aboriginal people in terms of being able to have some decision making over their own children, their own childcare agencies to look after their children, etc. And, and I think, you know, as I've sort of tried to describe, the two movements grow together, you know, fuse together, you know, the militant, you know, sort of working class movement which was actually able to bring to bear a power which could deliver and force the system to make concessions to, to Aboriginal demands as that power has fallen away, as that power has been broken up through the 1980s, through the neoliberalism, through the privatisation, so too has the capacity of Aboriginal communities to exert, you know, um, you know what, what they want to see, you know, in terms of, in terms of self-determination. And, there's, and there's, um, there's nothing inherently progressive at all, actually, about talking about Aboriginal law or Aboriginal title over land or things like that if you're doing it in the way that Noel Pearson does it which is all you environmentalists cut out so I can sell this land to a mining company. Or if you do it in the way that the Northern Land Council does it, you know, in terms of we're going to put a nuclear waste dump here, you know, and anyone who tries to say otherwise is just interfering with our Aboriginal autonomy or whatever. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's only given a radical quality if it's a movement of emancipation. 
if it's actually about saying the system itself, you know, needs to actually change and, and, is, and, is, and is fusing with, uh, you know, forms of power, you know, particularly, you know, the, the, the central importance of working class power to actually, to actually turn those things around and, and, and fight them back. And I did just want to end in terms of the, the depths of where we are at now, I think, in terms of the, the way that the government has been able to bury a politics of self-determination, the way that the government has tried to say that we need to go back to controlling people's money, you know, forcing them to work in these terrible conditions, take their children away because they can't look after them, take their land off them because you can't look after them, in terms of what they actually did to Dagaragu with the intervention. I've been to Dagaragu a number of times since the intervention. They went into the middle of that community, which occupied vest his land and said, we are refusing to move because this is our home. And they plonked a government business manager office right in the middle of it, put cyclone wire up around the outside. And this person sat in there, supposedly now in charge of the community, and didn't even talk to anyone in the community for five years. You know, this government business manager's office right in the heart of Dagger Radio. I think that speaks volumes that the intervention was a dagger into what the Gurindji and others at the time had actually stood up and what they were actually fighting for. As Jason said, people working for rations again. You know, I've been, you know, fighting hard, you know, with Gurindji families who've had children taken off them by police, uh, children taken off them by, you know, by, 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 by welfare officers and, and, and taken to distant, you know, sort of distant lands. So, like, I think, you know, we've got a, a, an incredible sort of task that's set out for us in terms of rebuilding, you know, rebuilding the, the, the movements that can actually turn, you know, sort of turn this, turn this situation around. And I think trying to look, look to, you know, Wade Hill and what it tells us about the radical potential of black struggle in this country and about the absolute centrality and importance of working class power to actually deliver gains, fight for gains and win gains and about what all of us can actually gain in terms of getting a much clearer understanding of the world, of, of, of how it oppresses us, and how we can actually go about fighting us, if we can bring those two, if we can bring those two things together, you know, around, you know, around, uh, around demands that are, you know, that, that we can actually go out and fight for and win. Thank you.